New on Curiosity Stream, how do you connect a 16th century potato to limitless energy production? Could Napoleon's toothpick have a direct link to a machine that predicts the future? And how can a 1700s conch shell chart a course to humans connecting their brains to the internet? James Burke's visionary series Connections returns for a new generation. Experience all new Connections with monthly annual and bundled plans. Find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. Whether you're making a traditional roasted turkey or spicy turkey tacos, your go-to shrimp cocktail, or your first Cajun risotto, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace your traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Choose from a great selection of digital coupons and use them up to five times in one transaction. Check our app for details. Baker's, fresh for everyone. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Put us in the frame of mind to accept the deviousness of man. We reach into that philosophical legacy bequeathed us by the immortal bard, Shakespeare. Men, he says, should be what they seem, or those that be not, would they might seem none. The lie or the truth? Who is false, who is not? And we have 60 minutes to find out. We find it peculiar, Professor Versigi, that the man who robbed your safe left cigarette stubs of a brand you say are made only for you. Uh, let me see. Uh, they are mine. I cannot deny it. Isn't cannot deny a peculiar way of putting it? I don't understand you, police. I report a robbery and you treat me as if I had stolen from myself, as if I were the criminal. That, sir, is entirely possible. mystery drama, The Versegi Case, adapted from the classic German story by Carl Rosner, is dramatized especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene and stars Arnold Moss. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Budapest, in the era of wine, women, songs, and swindlers. In many ways, life in the 1800s is as exciting as life in our century. There are just as many good men and certainly just as many bad. Where then to begin? Why, at that address at which you'll find both good and bad, the Central Police Office. Plout? Uh, Plout, come in here. Good morning, Commissioner. Oh, what's the problem? Shut the door behind you, will you, Plout? Mm -hmm. Secrets. Secrets. No more than the usual in this place. Now, I thought it better for the morale of the other detectives and police if I extended my compliments to you in private. Compliments? Commissioner, are you not feeling well? Plout, the department greatly appreciates your rounding up all those... Romanian swindler. <laughs> Thank you. But I must see him. I must see the commissioner of police without no, who, who is that out there? Someone who must see you, I would say. No, no, no. no I do not wish to see the lieutenant, nor do I wish to see the captain. Uh, either a nut or rich. Perhaps both. I'll take care of it. I am Detective Plout. Perhaps I can help. There has been a terrible robbery, and I am the victim. That is my wife and I. You must tell the commissioner I am here. Professor Sandor Dersigi. Professor Dersigi, if you would be good enough to wait, I shall tell him the moment he is free. No, I cannot wait. I will not wait. Which door is his? Oh, yes, there I see it. No, 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 you cannot go in there. Can't I, though? Uh, commissioner Franz? Yes, Professor Dersigi. Come in, come in. How do you know my name? 
I would say there isn't anyone in this entire building who is not aware of your presence. I am sorry, Commissioner. The gentleman insisted. No, Trout, stay here. Wait, all oh, nerve. I took such nerve for me to come here to the police station. I am on the edge all the time. All the time. You see, I am... Well, let, let me explain. As you have probably gathered, I am... A, at least the doctors say I am a, extremely nervous. I am in a highly nervous state. Very excitable. Uh, professor, I, uh, sit down. Uh, now uh, go ahead. The chair won't bite you. Yeah, well, uh, what, what I wish to explain... Detective is that, uh, Plout, uh, would you pour the professor some water from the pitcher by the window, please? Some water? Uh, two glasses there, Plout. Fill them both and give one to the professor. Oh, that's very kind of you, sir, but I am not thirsty. Here is your glass, professor. Ah, well, why not? Uh, professor... Would you be kind enough to drink the entire glass of water? Yes, glad to. I am thirsty after all. Ah, ah. It is a scientific fact that water is an effective tranquilizer. Now, quietly uh, and as reasonably as possible, will you tell us why you are here? I, I, I am attached to the Budapest University from which I had to retire last year because of nervous disorder. Uh, last night, my wife and I returned from Vienna where I had gone for treatment and uh, I was very tired from the journey. I went to bed immediately. This morning, uh, oh, I... To think of it, to think of it. Uh, out the other glass of water, quickly. No, 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 I'm all right, I'm perfectly all right. This morning, you discovered you had been robbed. Commissioner Franz, how extraordinary you should know that. I, I was told you had a sixth sense. <laughs> it is Detective Richard Plout here who is blessed with a sixth sense. I have only the other five. Now, to continue, Professor... Uh, you were robbed? I, in my study, I have a safe. The safe was open. I looked inside. 150,000 gulden worth of securities and almost all my wife's best jewelry are gone. And is there anyone in your household who might have a duplicate key? No, no, no one. We live in an apartment. It's very nice, third floor on the Kernerstrasse. When we are there, a cleaning woman comes in every day. Downstairs is the janitor, but the, no one has any keys. Yeah. Do you suspect anyone you know who might rob you? Someone I know. Oh, exactly what I said, Professor. Someone? Oh, no, no, no. Decidedly no, no. Ah. You are married, Professor? Uh, yes. My wife accompanied me to the sanatorium near Vienna. She was with me the whole time. We closed up the apartment. Your wife was actually in the sanatorium while you were there? Oh, yes, yes. They have accommodations for relatives. It was not very pleasant for her, but she is a devoted wife. And she wants me to be well again and get rid of this hateful nervous disorder. Fortunately, I have only been plagued with it this past year. Oh, she has been wonderful. One could not ask for more. I am a lucky man, and I know it. Why, I am 50 years old, and Helena is half my age. Indeed. 25, huh? That would interest you, Detective Plout, wouldn't it? And extremely beautiful, I am proud to say. Uh, Detective Plout, uh, I would like you to take on this case. Uh, knowing your interests and expertise, I think you might enjoy it. I, I mean, solve it. <laughs> well, there's nothing more we wait for. Professor, take your umbrella and let us all go directly to your apartment. <laughs> is my study. Uh, look at it. Everything upside down. My papers everywhere. I... Uh, where is the safe, Professor Versigi? No, here. Against the wall. I have touched nothing. This is just as you found it, Professor. You haven't changed anything in the room? No, exactly as I found it this morning. 
I did examine the inside of the safe when I found the door open, but I touched nothing, nothing. My wife said I should not until it has been examined by the police. Oh, oh, Helena, there you are. Ah, oh, good day, gentlemen. Oh, my dear. Oh, this is my wife, Helena, gentlemen. These gentlemen are from the police. You haven't been overdoing it, have you? Oh, the professor did not exaggerate. She is stunning. Mm. Mrs. Versigi, this is Commissioner Franz. My name is Richard Plout. My pleasure. Do you know whether any other pieces of furniture were damaged? Or whether anything else was stolen besides, I understand, the securities and your jewels? Well, I would say no to both questions, Mr. Plout. Uh, the jewels and the securities were in a small box. It is still there. You can see it. But see, empty. That thief got himself quite a lot for his trouble. Plout, over here. Used matches, pieces of burnt candles. And what's this? I would say pieces of iron broken off. And there on the floor, that piece looks like it was broken from a file. That's strange. I'll slip these into our envelopes. Anything else? I've already taken the cigarette ashes and the stubs. A very careless robber leaving the ends of cigarettes about. You are both very careful about your work. Ah, we try. Whatever is found at the scene of a crime is like handwriting. A personal message, in this case, from the thief. And uh, you can trace the criminal with cigarette stops and so on? We hope to. Uh, Commissioner, I would like your opinion over here, please. Uh, what is it, Plan? Will you examine the door of the safe? Oh. It's been hacked about. The hinges and the lock have been filed in a haphazard way. And if you look more closely, those marks have nothing to do with opening the safe. Oh, yeah. You're right, Blount. The door was opened with a key. You agree, then? Oh, absolutely. The marks are made on the safe door after it was opened. An amateur trying to make it look as if it had been forced open. Uh, what are you two looking at now? These marks. Yeah, whoever it was certainly made a mess trying to open it. A mess, exactly, Professor. Have you an axe in the house? An axe? Oh, you, you had better ask Helena. She runs the household. Is, do we have an axe, dear? Or a hatchet? Uh, I, I'll go see. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. I don't understand. Uh, Professor, this safe has not been subjected to what we might call professional treatment. You mean you can tell what kind of a person did this? No, there isn't a burglar tool used by a professional thief that does not leave its mark. We know them all. Here, however... Oh, this is our hatchet. We keep it in the kitchen. Will it do? Very nicely. Commissioner, would you like to do the matching? Thank you. Uh-huh. Ah, yes. Here, too. Yes, yes. Ah, yes, what? This hatchet and these deep scratches and cuts match. Is that uh, unusual? I don't think the professor understands what you are getting at, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Unusual? Yes. I find it remarkable, sir, that the thieves should have maltreated your safe with your own hatchet. <laughs> That is, obviously, to those who follow the workings of detection, Commissioner Frank of the Budapest Police has already made up his mind. But then, if renowned Sandor Versegi has falsified a robbery, there must be a reason. That may be the most interesting path to follow. Not the how, but the why. We shall pick up the trail exactly where we left off when I return shortly with Act Two. Dissemblance. That is the theme of this performance at Mystery Theater. Who is performing? Who speaks the truth? Sometimes people are so adept at disguising their true selves, they begin to believe they are what they pretend. Detective Richard Plout and the commissioner resume the investigation. 
Now, as to these papers lying about here on the floor, is this exactly the way you found them? Well, I think so. I hold up this insurance policy. Is it yours? Uh, well, I, is it mine? Does it have my name on it? Does... What does it say, Plop? Sondor Versege insures himself against robbery with certain itemized pieces of jewelry and a sum of 150,000 gulden. Then you're insured against robbery, Professor. <laughs> you didn't think to inform us of that. Didn't you tell the gentleman that we were insured? Oh, Sandor, how could you forget a thing like that? Why, that's the reason, sir, that, that we can meet this loss with a certain amount of calm. Calm? I would say that Professor Valsagy has been quite excited about this robbery. It was his nervousness which first attracted our attention when he came to report the incident at the police station. And now we find he is insured so as to completely cover his loss. I cannot see any reason for his great excitement. My husband is ill. Surely you have noticed that. We have just returned from the sanatorium where he was being treated. And now... To you gentlemen of the police, robbery may be an everyday occurrence. But to us, even though we were insured, the invasion of our home by, by, by strangers, well, it is... Uh, Mrs. Versigi, forgive us. We don't wish to add to your unhappiness. Commissioner, why don't we permit Mr. and Mrs. Versigi to pass the rest of the day alone? <laughs> I was unhappy to discover the Versailles had been insured all along. No matter how I rationalized it, it was the old insurance game. I could see the professor was in a very nervous state and so perhaps not accountable for his actions. But Helena, his beautiful young wife, how could she know nothing of her husband's deception? How could she be innocent? The following morning, I was at their door. Ah, I was expecting you earlier, Mr. Plant. I came as soon as I could. I see you have not had time to unpack. How is your husband? Ah, this robbery has undone a great deal of the good of his visit to the sanatorium. He's in his bedroom, reading. If you like, I shall be happy to bring in your suitcases from the hall. Oh, no, I, I wouldn't dream of it. That, uh, that's a beautiful coat lying there. What is that for? Seal. But it's the astrakhan collar my husband's so fond of. Mm -hmm. He takes it everywhere. It was much too hot for Vienna, so we left it with his stepbrother who lives there. When did you leave Budapest? The 27th of March. We first went to see Laos. Laos? And my husband's stepbrother. He's written us, insisting we spend a few days with him before going on to the sanatorium. And uh, where is that? In a suburb of Vienna. And Calden Lertgeben. We stayed at the sanatorium until the 3rd of May, and my husband was really improving. And then two days with Lars, and then back here the day before yesterday. Ah, there you are, Helena. Oh, oh, you have a visitor. Uh, Mr. Uh, I've forgotten your name. Plaut, Richard Plaut, Mr. Versige. I uh, was going to ask if I might continue examining your study. Well, I have no objection. Follow me. Uh, Mr. Plout, may I offer you a glass of wine? Oh, 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 don't tempt me. Police regulations forbid that while a man is on duty. A great pity. Still, I am not a policeman, so I shall have a glass. Ah, Sandra, don't. You know what the doctor said. It's a stimulant, and for the present, no stimulants. Is a cigarette all right? Oh, don't be silly. Of course it is. Especially since you brought back your special favorites from Vienna. Uh, may I have one, Professor? <laughs> yes, glad to. Uh, you will enjoy them. Made especially for me in Vienna. You can't get them here. Nobody smokes them in Budapest. Oh, really? Really? And you are quite certain this room was... Thoroughly cleaned before you went away. Hmm? Housekeeping is my pride and joy, Mr. Plow. And the cigarette you're smoking, Professor, have you smoked in here since you returned? No, I have not. Well, why, why all this questioning about cigarettes? Let me show you something. In this envelope are two cigarette stubs we picked up in this room yesterday. 
Now, isn't it rather remarkable that whoever plundered your safe smoked the same cigarettes as you do? A brand, you say, which is unattainable in Budapest. Now, see for yourself. Open the envelopes. Oh, he's right, Sandor. These stubs are the same, but uh, how, how is it possible? Uh, let, let me see. He is right. Those stubs are mine. I cannot deny it. You said I cannot deny. Uh, isn't that a peculiar word to use under the circumstances? Well, it's nothing. Just words. I did not mean anything by it. <laughs> I do not understand you, police. I report I, I report a crime to you and you treat me as if I were the criminal. Sandra, Sandra, please. Uh, Mr. Plout, if your investigation results in a kind of third degree, I must ask you to leave. My husband tires easily. Sandra, will you go lie down? I shall be with you in a moment. I, I, I'll see Mr. Plout to the door. All right, then. But don't be long. Uh, Mr. Plout... You were asking about household tools yesterday. Well, I was getting out the checkbook, and I found this um, this broken piece of metal in my husband's desk. I, I thought I'd better give it to you. Now, what do you suppose it is? It's what they call a file. The end is broken off. Is it helpful for you to have it? I regret to say, Mrs. Versigi, this broken file in your husband's desk is extremely helpful. To say I was shocked is putting it mildly. I could draw only two conclusions. In attacking his safe to simulate a robbery, the professor had broken the file himself, or Mrs. Versagi was trying to implicate her husband. I went downstairs and asked if the janitor would see me. This is a respectable house. Why are the police asking me questions? When a robbery has been reported, we ask everybody. A robbery? Who? Where? Professor Versigi, upstairs on the third. Oh, look, he's quite mad. He complains about my children making noise. I don't think he's quite right in the head. If I wasn't sorry for his wife... I could make a few complaints myself. Indeed. Oh, he thinks he can make all the noises he wants, and that's what... When you download the Baker's app, you have easy access to savings every day. Get the most out of weekly sales and receive personalized coupons to save on your favorite items, all while earning one fuel point for every dollar spent. Baker's makes it easy to save while you shop, whether it's in-store or online, so you get the most value out of every trip, every time. Download the Baker's app now to save big on your next purchase. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Must have a digital account to redeem offers. Restrictions may apply. See site for details. All right. But if my children happen to run up and down stairs, it's not. What noises? I thought they were away for a month. Don't you think I know what's going on here? What kind of a janitor do you think I am? The professor came back one afternoon and evening about a week after they left. And the noise he made in his apartment. Oh, you thought he was chopping up the furniture. You're quite certain it was Professor Versigi. I don't say anything unless I'm sure of it. It was the 3rd or 4th of April, early in the evening. My door was open. I looked up. There he was in his brown fur coat with the astrakhan collar. He didn't even say hello. I thought, that's pretty silly. Such a hot day, his face buried in the collar. Well, he went right upstairs. Then after making all that noise, he comes down again, doesn't say a word, all bundled up he is. Now he reports a robbery. <laughs> if you ask me... Well, it takes all kinds in this world. Um, anything else, officer? I think not. How is the case going, Plout? It's not going very well. Oh, I'm sorry. I have some information that might cheer you. That list of Versigi's stolen securities we sent out. Here's a wire from a bank in Vienna. As per your inquiry, on April 6th, 
Hungarian bonds valued 40,000 gulden presented at Anglo Bank Vienna. Money paid out. Huh. What do you say to that, Blount? Our man is supposed to be in a sanatorium, and he cashes in some of his own bonds. Uh, I better take the overnight train to Vienna. If you're going to the Anglo Bank to get a description of who cashed in the securities, you might also visit the Austrian Bank. I have their telegram, and they bought 60,000 gulden worth of Vasagi's securities. May I have both telegrams, please? Certainly. Have a good trip, Plout, and try to keep away from the ladies. Hello, Plout. Is that you? Yes, Commissioner Franz. I am calling you from Vienna. I have been to both banks. The man who cashed in the securities in each could not have been Versagi, nor are the signatures for the money his signatures. Versagi could have had an accomplice. Oh, yes, yes, that's possible. But why would an accomplice be that stupid, A, to sign Versagi's name, and B, to wear a conspicuous overcoat in both banks? The astrakhan collar, eh? Uh-huh, the same one. Just to be completely certain, I am going to the sanatorium in Carlton Leutgeben to make sure Mr. and Mrs. Versigi remain the entire month there. Then I am going to have a chat with Versigi's stepbrother, this uh, Lajos. See what he can tell me. So you won't be back in Budapest before Wednesday? I don't expect so. But you can always reach me at the central Vienna police station. I think I may go pay Versagy a visit. Uh, no, I, I would not do that. No? Why not? I think by tomorrow I may have evidence that clears him. And he's such an excitable man, I wouldn't like anything to push him over the edge. Promise me you won't go see him before I get back. It's open and shut. There's no question. You promise. I would like to be the first to see the professor. All right. Wednesday, then. I never got to see Sandor Versagi. The next morning, I was handed a telegram at the Vienna police station from Commissioner Franz. Stop further investigation in Versagi case. Guilt proven by me beyond doubt. Unfortunately, immediately after arrest, criminal committed suicide. Come back. Detective Richard Plout was stunned that Sandor Versegi should take his own life at the very moment his innocence might be proven. Why had he killed himself? Police records are full of cases of those who are unable to withstand pressure, who prefer death to dishonor. No, Suicide is not always an admission of guilt. More when I return shortly with Act Three. A trained investigator leaves not one stone unturned, whether it be a slight case of theft or a serious case of murder. It is the very nature of the man to seek after the truth, however cleverly it may be hidden. Such a man is our detective, Richard Plout. He takes up the story. Versigi Laios, Schwinn Street 3 was the address in the directory. I know that the Versigis had stayed with his stepbrother before and after the professor's month in the sanatorium. Laios Versigi was a heavily built clean-shaven man with thick black hair. He sat me in his drawing room, his back to the window, keeping his face in the shadow. An old trick. So you are from the police, are you? Is something the matter? You have a stepbrother in Budapest? Yes, indeed. Sandor, very fine professor at the university. I have just received a message from Budapest, Mr. Bersigi. Which tells me your stepbrother was completely crushed by the suspicion. More than that. But he is dead by his own hand. Oh, no. Oh, merciful heavens. Ah, the poor, 
poor man. How... How unfair, how wicked. Uh, look, I'm sorry. You must think me absurdly emotional. He... He was my stepbrother. And only a few days ago, he was in this very room. He and his wife, they stayed in my guest room at the end of the hall, and we... How terrible this all is. Your stepbrother's death just at this time places Mrs. Versagy in a very painful position. His suicide will appear it was all true. People will say he died to escape punishment and dishonor. So unless we succeed in discovering the real thief, his name will be destroyed. The real thief? Uh-huh. Then you don't believe Sandor had any connection with the theft? Oh, no. No, the real thief is quite another person. That's why I came to see you. Yes, but uh, how can I help you? We have discovered traces here in Vienna of the man who apparently is the robber. Now, obviously, this man knew the professor's habits and must have met him while he was here. Do you know of any such person he might have seen? No, I... I really don't. When Sandor and Helena came here, I saw very little of them. I, I know that Sandor visited several old Viennese friends, but uh, who they were, I don't know. My sister-in-law should be able to tell you. I expect you're right. I shall leave now. I am sorry to have been the bearer of such bad news. It's incredible. Awful. Uh, please, if there is any further way I can be of help, don't hesitate to call on me. I certainly shall. Commissioner, how did this happen? Oh, I expected it. The man was always guilty and he knew it. Uh, just, just tell me what happened. Oh, well, he had his house watched, naturally. A man on the roof over his apartment. Uh, one morning, the janitor was seen moving a small trunk from the basement. When questioned, he said the professor was taking a trip. Now, if you were in my shoes, Plout, what would you have done? What I did. I went to see him directly. Well, Commissioner, what are you doing here? Where are you going? Pushing your way in here. You appear to be packing to go on a trip. That's rather odd. Uh, yes, yes, I am. Well, what I do, where I am going, is no business of yours. Uh, it is my business. You are going to Vienna. Well, since you know it, why do you bother me with questions? Now, please, I am in a hurry. I have sent for a cab to take me to the station. Spare yourself the trouble, Professor. The cab will not be here. We have had this house under surveillance, and no one comes or goes without our permission. How dare you? But what do you want of me? How dare the police put a watch upon me? I want to know what takes you to Vienna. I owe you no accounting. As you like. But then I shall be obliged to forbid your departure. Professor Versky, I must do my duty, hard it may be. And my duty, after all the evidence we have against you, is to arrest you. Professor, come back here. <laughs> He ran down the stairs, but I had a policeman on duty there. So he turned around and raced up the stairs, crying all the time, I am innocent, I am innocent. He went up another flight, calling out to his wife, who hadn't come home yet. Oh, how ghastly, the poor, demented man. Another one of our men came downstairs from the roof. Versigi kept running back and forth, calling, Helena, Helena. Then I think he lost his head completely. I, I tried to reach him, but he eluded me on the stairs ran out into the street blindly right into a big van which could not stop. He was dead when I got to his side. It's good of you to see me, Mrs. Vesagy. It's so hard. Anyone connected with the police, I... I, I, I know. You have every reason to despise us. They drove him to his death with their suspicions. Sander was the kindest, gentlest man who ever lived. Mrs. Versigi, I am certain your husband had nothing to do with the crime. 
You believe in him? Yes, yes, I do. How well did your husband get along with his stepbrother? Well, for a year, they, they've been very good friends. And before that? Mrs. Versigi, it's important for me to know that. They avoided each other for many years. And why was that? It was because of me. My husband married very late in life. I, I was a student of his at the university... We'd only been married for five years. <laughs> Believe me, I would do anything to spare you this ordeal. No, 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 it's, it's all right. When Sandor and I were engaged, Lars, his stepbrother, came to visit. I, I didn't know him. I was friendly in a, a natural, normal way. I mean, the brother and my fiancé. But um, he misunderstood it. One night I happened to be alone with him and... Uh, he put his arms around me. Oh, I, I hate to think of it. Fortunately, Sandor came in. There were words. Sandor literally threw him out. And until a year ago, they never spoke. Well, how did they become friends again? It was Sandor. I told you what a kind man he was. He heard that Lars had business difficulties and, and he sent him money. Later, Lars paid it back and apologized, and that was that. So when he heard we were going to Vienna to the sanatorium, he wrote and he insisted that we stay with him first. You did not ask to stay with him. He asked you. That's right. Why? One last question. Have you any idea why the professor wanted to go to Vienna? Well, he was very quiet about it. I, I think he was going to see Lars. Why, I don't know. He, he did say I wasn't to go with him. Mr. Plout, is it possible? Is there any chance of finding the real criminal soon? Soon? By tomorrow. The funeral is tomorrow. I know what you are going to say. I can promise you that your husband will be laid to rest with his honor and reputation clear. <laughs> It's almost too good to be true. That's the least we can do for you. Thank you. Mr. Plout, I did not expect you back in Vienna so soon. Uh, please forgive this confusion, but I am here in the midst of work. I am extremely busy, so it is going to be impossible for me to go to Budapest for the funeral. You have probably seen in the newspapers that officially the police believe your stepbrother guilty. And they have stopped any further action in the case. Yes, I read that. Poor Sandor. If he had not been in such a state, he would never have arranged a pretended robbery to collect the insurance. Then you now believe him guilty. There is so much that points to him. I don't know what to think. Well, that is why I came here today with the good news that your stepbrother is innocent. What? Oh, I thought you would be pleased. Yes, proof positive. You have proof? Do you remember my asking you who your stepbrother might have met while in Vienna? Let's say it was some man he hadn't seen in a long time. A relative, perhaps. Let us assume this man to be in financial straits. He learns the professor has a large fortune in securities, jewels, and so forth, left in a closed and unoccupied apartment in Budapest. If I remember, you yourself told me the professor was very frank in talking about his own affairs. I don't remember saying anything of the kind. Oh, didn't you? Oh, then I must be mistaken. But it doesn't matter. We're only talking about possibilities. Let's assume Professor Versigay told this interesting fact to, say, to you, for instance. Yes, yes, to you. Or to anyone else, let's say, to the robber who took the money eventually. We know for a fact the robbery took place April 4th. Two days after the professor entered the sanatorium. The janitor saw the robber pass in and out and thought he was the professor because he wore the professor's fur overcoat. 
The police took for granted the robbery was faked since keys had been used to enter the apartment and to open the safe. And a certain kind of cigarette had been smoked, marks made on the safe by a kitchen hatchet, etc., etc., etc. Uh, did they find all these things? Oh, they did. But in my opinion, these things prove the professor's innocence. I really uh, cannot understand. It looks to me as if the real robber wanted to throw suspicion on your stepbrother. Don't you think so? I don't know. There is one missing link in our chain of evidence. How did the robber come into possession of Professor Versergi's overcoat and his keys? Any ideas? I am up to my neck in work. I'm no detective, and I would very much prefer that you follow up your investigations alone until you really need my help. I need it now. You see, Mr. Versigay, my theory for the solution is very simple. I believe your brother left his overcoat and his keys with the robber here in Vienna in some place where he thought them safe. A great deal warmer in Vienna than Budapest. It would be natural to leave it here with you. Let us say in the room you had given him. Huh? Will you excuse me if I ring for your maid? What right do you have to come barging in here and to... You rang, sir. Would you please show me the room occupied recently by Professor and Mrs. Versagy? Uh, certainly, sir. In this way. Madame, do you remember the professor's visit early this month? Did he leave anything here when he went to the sanatorium? Oh, yes, sir. And this was the room. He left his fur overcoat and some other things. Uh, they, they were locked in that cupboard. Uh -huh. Who had the keys to this cupboard? Oh, Mr. Versegi gave the key to the professor. He, he took it with him. Oh, dear me. Someone must have mislaid the key. The door has been forced from its hinges. Look, look carefully. What are you doing? Mr. Versigi, the police are the ones who ask the questions. Notice, sir, someone has tampered with the hinges of this cupboard door. What do you mean? I have found a missing link in the chain of evidence. Laios Versigi, I arrest you in the name of the law. Detective Richard Plout kept his word. On the following day, Sandover Segi was buried with honor and dignity befitting an honest man. Perhaps in death, the professor has a lesson for all of us. How sacredly reputation must be guarded. How fragile a thing it is. And should it be lost, it is rarely regained. More on this when I return shortly. And today's story with a word from Shakespeare, a favorite pastime of ours. For the tragedy of Sandover Segi was also the tragedy of Othello, who said, Who steals my purse steals trash. Tis something, nothing, t'was mine, tis his, and has been slave to thousands. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. Our cast included Arnold Moss, William Griffiths, Carol Titel, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.